Can I take some questions? Yes. Uh, good morning, uh, Bob Kolimo. Uh, it's always a pleasure to meet some people here. My name is Wanderi. Um, it's always a pleasure to meet uh, Joshua and you uh, for the reason that uh, I, I really follow what you do because uh, Safaricom and KCB are my flagships at the Stock Exchange. Uh, now, I want to ask you one question. You, your company is worth, you say, it is eight billion in terms of that's the, the net worth of the company. The total revenue mobilization for Kenya last year just hit ten billion dollars. So you, you can see relatively, you as a company are almost a quasi state within a state. In other words, your net your total net worth is virtually equal to the state's capability to mobilize its resources. Now the question I want to pose uh, to you is this. Uh, you've talked about creating value. Mm -hmm. Creating value for in, in the country. We are a net importer. Even as we mobilize 10 billion, much of what we consume is, is from elsewhere. Now, you've also talked about sustainability, that companies and business people need to think about the 50 years uh, in terms of where they will be. My question goes directly to you and perhaps even to your colleagues mm -hmm. who are leading the major companies in this country. Yes, you want to make profit for us as shareholders. You depend on this economy. You depend on our people to make your money. We are getting, we who have invested are getting our, our, our dividends because people are spending uh, from the services provided by your companies. Now, I know you will tell me that you are answerable to shareholders, but I want you to look at it on the other side. That in terms, I know you are doing something to try and create value. This, uh, there is a dependency in Kenya, and you see the young people, all of them, what they want to do is focus on giving service rather than production. I won't say where I work, but where I work, we get worried because we see some things getting imported which ought not to be imported into this country, including furniture, because we have stopped uh, having carpenters. I would want you and perhaps your colleagues in the, in the uh, who, those who are in the financial sector, telecommunication sector, these are the growing sectors in Kenya. What would you, what, you can have a revolution, not, not in terms of political, but a social revolution of showing people that we do not need to get welders and carpenters from Tanzania and China. I mean, so that we do not have this, um, this preoccupation with university education where everybody is a graduate, but nobody can work. Everybody wants a job, but nobody can work. Yeah, um, thank you. Yeah, I, I think you make a very good point. Um, actually, the first point you made wasn't a very good point because we're, as a state, we're actually bigger than Rwanda. Um, <laughs> I, I actually, I, I, I told that to President Kagame in Los Angeles last year, to which his response was, that's good because Rwanda is a very big shareholder of Safaricom, so that was good. Um, but, but I think you're, you're, you're right. Look, the, the uh, urge to put people into universities is a misguided one. And it's not misguided because I didn't go to university, which everybody knows. Um, <laughs> then I always say, you know, always be the dumbest person in the room, and I always prove that to be right. Um, oh. That was a joke, nobody got that. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we stop people into universities as a short-term fix, because we just want to get them off the streets. And actually the universities, I mean, there's some very good universities doing some, some great stuff, uh, but not everybody is made to go to university. Uh, we were watching a video the other day, which is the education in the US versus Germany. So whilst Germany would train people to be someone to be a chef. Um, America just shoved them at university and they come out and they actually can't cook. Uh, and we have this problem here. You know, I'm a member of the Capital Club and we've struggled to find a chef. Uh, now we're finding a chef in, in New Zealand. You know, what the hell is that about? So we do need to stop stuffing people into university to get useless degrees. And I keep saying to people that, um, I hope we're not going to get that many questions. Um, I keep saying to people that, uh, when people come out of university, they don't have the right skills because the universities are teaching them to remember things and they're remembering things which are useless to us as business leaders because 
you know, to pass the, I'm sure it's laughing, to pass the, the exam, you just have to recall. And the stuff which they're telling them to recall are not things that is of any use to me anymore. Uh, so that needs to stop. Um, in terms of uh, what a business is doing, well, you know, a long time ago, I said that I would never outsource my call center, for example. Um, there was a lot of pressure. A lot of shareholders would say, why don't you outsource? Because it's cheaper. You can go to Egypt, you can go to India. And I said no. And my predecessor, Michael Joseph, said no. Uh, the result is we've created 1,600 jobs. And now we're in the process of creating a further 500 you know, for that call center. Um, because the people who are paying the five, four shillings a minute are Kenyans. And the value needs to go back to Kenyans, not to Indians or Egyptians. I've got nothing wrong, nothing against Indians or Egyptians. And you know, we are getting much more focused on uh, creating more opportunities for Kenyans. I mean, a silly example, for example. We decided to provide free coffee in the, uh, in the building and have these Nescafe coffee machines. But actually, two days ago, we decided, you know, why are we having Nescafe co coffee machines? Because they're not even using Kenyan coffee. So we were going to replace those. I hope we've told Nescafe. <laughs> you know, we're going to replace those with freshly grown Kenyan coffee. Uh, we are, well, I mean, it's not, thank you. Thank you, but we shouldn't be applauded for that because if I was uh, Japanese, you know what, I'd be using Japanese coffee. So why the hell is Kenyans? We're not. You know, why aren't you people wearing T-shirts which are made in Kenya? Uh, because you, you buy it from India because it's cheaper. So, but, you know, the way we, we tackle the, the subject is by the sustainable development goals. You know, we've got nine sustainable goals that we have focused upon. Um, all of my leaders, I've got, I can see a few of them in the room today, Steve Shaker, for example. Um, you know, he has picked which of the goals he's going to go for, and, you know, he's being measured on it. Kui in the front row here, she's got her goals that she's measured on. That's the way you, you tackle the issue. And I know if I, um, I usually pick on Joshua, but let me pick on, on Lavin. Standard Chartered Bank is one of the, if not the leading bank in this space around sustainability. And recently, uh, last year I think, I can't remember who it was, it was um, Investec I think, did a survey on companies that focused on environmental, social and governance issues. And uh, they found that the companies that scored highest on ESG were the companies that performed the greatest in terms of profitability. In Africa, the one who came number one was the Standard Chartered Bank. Number two was Safaricom. Number three was KCB. There is a direct what, 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 what was that? I'll give you the report. Mm. It's, um, it, it, it creates a relationship between companies that were scoring high on, um, <clears throat> on ESG mm. and the relationship between that and their profitability. Mm. And you know, I was pleased because I'm good friends with the Standard Chartered Bank at the group at the local level and at the personal level. I was pleased to be beaten by, by Lamin, and I'm sure Joshua didn't mind being beaten by two friends as well. But these are the three companies across Africa, actually, who came number one, number two, number three. Wow. Thanks, and good morning, Bob. Um, without a doubt, you're a very powerful sustainability leader in Kenya, and your, your sustainability agenda um, is very strong and clear in this report. Um, at the same time, uh, Safaricom plays a, a major role in the delivery chain, for lack of a better word, um, in um, the provision or the delivery of sports betting services. And to an increasing extent, and maybe to an increasingly concerning extent, so does KCB Mpesa and Mshwari. How can you leverage on both those two situations to see opportunities to influence the direction and the management of that sector so that we actually see that sector and all the money that's flowing around in it start to translate into future job creation so that two years from now you, you can stand up in some forum and say, we've actually... Um, catapulted or converted that sector into helping create a lot more jobs so that we're talking about a great future for Kenya. That's my, my first question. The second one is interrelated. How again do you as a sustainability leader 
support people like Lamin in making a stronger case for not moving shared services from Kenya to Chennai and China um, and to actually um, connecting all the dots for future sustainability so that we keep jobs like those at Standard Chartered in Kenya and build a future. Thank you. Ooh. Oof. <laughs> so two tough questions there, actually. Very tough questions. Um, and the sports betting question is not the first time we've, um, we've been tackled. And I'm not sure I've got a good answer for that. Uh, but yes. I, uh, well, yes, of course. Um, <laughs> you know, betting and gambling is something which is, can be a very dangerous thing. And we've seen this across the world. Uh, so responsible gaming is something which I think we all need to put much more focus on. Um, government has seized the opportunity to, to tax it. And I know the betting companies don't like that much but at least some of it kind of gets back into the, uh, into the economy. Um, I think we just have to work with our partners to make sure that the right, uh, the right controls are there. Uh, but, you know, addiction is a, is a very dangerous thing, of course. Uh, I, I'm not a, an addictive person, so um, apart from the drugs, I'm not really addicted to anything else. <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke, Steve, right? <laughs> um, but I can see how betting, and we see many of our own staff who have fallen into that trap and we're trying to provide some counseling to help them to get out of that. Um, so I, I think we just have to work as a society to, to ensure that people are operating to, you know, to proper standards, the international best, best practice. Uh, the morals of betting or not uh, you know, is a difficult thing, and I'm not going to comment on that. Um, I, uh, I think it's probably a bit unfair to put Lamin on the spot on this one, but let me, let me try and venture <laughs> without asking him to to do this. Let me try and venture. I mean, one of the things that, um, that Helen High said to me, and Helen is a writer, so she's like 30 something years old and such a firebrand. And when I said, Helen, why don't you come to Kenya? I can introduce you to some people. I can introduce you to the president and to the minister. She says, because you're too expensive. It's cheaper to go manufacture it in Ethiopia. And we can actually price ourselves out of the market. That's a delicate balance, because we're also talking about decent jobs and de decent wages. And I'm a big one for, for, for decent living wages, not minimum wages. Um, and that means different things to different, in different environments. Um, so it's, it's trying to hit a balance between, and I don't, you know, Lamin and I haven't talked, it's his business, not mine, haven't talked about this, but we do need to ensure that we're not pricing ourselves out of the market. And we do also need to ensure that we've got the right infrastructure in the country. So, you know, one of my very big customers mm -hmm. is now is currently pitching for providing shared service here in Kenya, and he's pitching against Geneva and Singapore. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, you know, we are kind of slicing our price right away to the bones in order to be able to provide him with the opportunity to pitch against those other two countries effectively. Um, so, I mean, that's how we want to work with our partners to create it. The, the other day, we, uh, we said that we wanted to become a, a raft. Um, we used to say platform. Uh, now, what, are, what I mean by that is that imagine that you're on a, a rapidly moving stream. Um, we want to be able to carry people to the destination that they want to get to safely. Um, and I say it's rapidly moving because technology is moving, consumer <coughs> tastes uh, are moving, and we want to be able to, to help that. Why do we want to do that? Because, as the gentleman there said, you know, we are a significant part of this economy. And this economy is a significant part of us. And so if he is successful, if Lamin is, is successful in winning that business back at some point, we want to play a, a role in that because it will create more jobs for the country. But I don't know, Lamin, do you, I don't know whether you want to defend yourself or... I, I think Lamin... Well, and can I also compliment Lamin on the point you were making that nine months ago... Uh, Lamine, we were all sitting together, I remember, and Lamine painted this picture of Brexit, of Trump, um, and was extremely far-sighted, Lamine. And uh, we are grateful, and we'll, we'll, we'll come back to find out yeah, what yeah, else is going to happen. There's more bad news to come. Well, I, well we better find out later. I'm not inviting back to my house, uh, no, no, thanks, Bob. Um, thanks, Ali Khan. I think, uh, first of all, I do not take any joy in predicting, having predicted the Brexit and the Trump uh, victory. I think, uh, sadly, um, that's the reality, but um, I wish it was, it was uh, the other way around. Let me just comment on a couple of things. One is on the issue of the shared service center. Um, as you rightly said, people have tried to link that to the rate capping. Uh, it was not. Um, this was a decision that had been taken 
really to centralize our global shared service centers in three locations globally. Uh, we had a shared service center in uh, Accra and one in Nairobi, and those, because they were not part of that global strategy, they then had to uh, move into, uh, into Chennai. However, despite the fact that um, we've talked about 300 jobs being at risk, internally we've struggled, we've strived to make sure that as many of those jobs at risk are actually absorbed into other parts of the bank. So the actual number that will be at risk will be far less than the 300 that has been announced, just to make that uh, very clear. And we're also looking at areas where we can actually grow so that we will then create more jobs uh, within, within the country. Now, the issue of, uh, first of all, I think brilliant presentation, uh, Bob. I thought uh, I like the sort of the whole tour the force in terms of, you know, the evolution of technology and, uh, and, and you know, where it has come from. Um, but just maybe your comment. Um, earlier on, when this whole revolution was going on uh, with the steam engine and, you know, the mass production by Henry Ford and all that, it was seen as a risk at some point, but the opportunity outweighed the risk. And I think in the end, what you ended up creating uh, was a growing middle class. So in the West, we saw, you know, especially after the uh, uh, Second World War, a very robust growth in the middle class. This phase of the revolution now, uh, what we're seeing, the digital uh, revolution, I'm just worried that it might be more of the risks rather than the opportunity uh, that is at play here. Uh, because what we are seeing is the decimation of the middle class. So you can create all these jobs, uh, sorry, all these uh, products more efficiently through robotics, uh, through digitization, but if there are no people to buy them and there's no middle class that can really sustain that growth, then really I think we are creating a problem for ourselves. And I think that is the element that I saw playing out both in the Brexit and the Trump uh, election, mm -hmm. where you know the, 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 there's no middle class that has a stake in the system, and therefore they are willing to just you know say okay, let the whole thing blow up because at the end of the day, what does it matter to me? So I don't know if you want to just comment on how the changes that we've seen in the past it was more of the opportunity rather than the risk. Today it's more of the risk rather than the opportunity. Yeah, I mean I absolutely agree. That it is much more of a risk, and you know I've been a a prophet of doom in my household. My wife has been trying to avoid me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is, you know, you're so damn depressing. Um, it's not quite true. But I, I, do, I do see it much more of a risk. Um, well, what it's doing is it's creating, it's creating greater inequalities. And when I put up the, I don't, I'm not picking on, on Mark, uh, but there, there are actually a few more Marks who are being created very quickly. And Uber, and I don't want to, I'm not talking about Uber as a competitor to Uber, but if I look at, at that space, what you're seeing now, and actually I shouldn't, it's, it's not fair to talk about Uber, but what you're finding with some companies is that the people who are, and it's not, I mean, I'm actually a big, a, a big admirer of Uber, so I, I know we tend to get a bit carried away with the competitive thing. Of course we want to compete with them, but actually we think the market is big enough anyway. Um, we're finding that what technology is doing is it's helping some people and leaving a lot more people behind. And yes, you're right. When Henry Ford did the cars, you know, it kind of grew the middle class and stuff. But by more people moving into the car washing sector, you know, somebody's going to have to have the car. Somebody's going to have to be able to pay for the car. In order to pay for the car, you need to have a job. And so that's why I think that there's some fake stuff happening. There's some fake employment. There's some fake getting people off the streets. So to the question on the university students a moment ago, um, you know, we're put, putting more people in Europe just to get them off the streets. But there's something that's going to happen at the point, because if you drive from here to Machacos, you look at the side of the street, you will see countless young men, mainly young men, sitting at the side of the street waiting for something. They're waiting for one of two things. One thing is much more likely to come than the other. Two things are opportunity or the other stuff. And the other stuff is actually what's more likely to come. But they're waiting. And you know, if you and I, as business leaders or political leaders, don't get on top of that, then it's going to be a problem. I also happen to think that this, this, this excitement, you would expect me as a, a head of a technology company to defend it. But I think technology actually is taking us into a difficult place. It's taking us to a dehumanized place. And I know a lot of people are sitting here and they're tweeting and stuff, but actually, a lot of people are not really listening to what we're, we're doing. They're telling people where they are 
and they're going to do selfies and stuff like that. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, in homes, and I know I'm going to get into trouble at the end of the session, but in homes, husbands and wives are sending text messages to each other. In meeting, in the offices, we are sending text messages. And I know I can see a second member of my exco here. And, and, you know, they know my views on the intersection of, the, the interruption of technology into our lives. Because as people, we should be doing much more of that. If we don't do that, if we put the technology in between us, then we can't feel the pain. And, and trust me, and as Annika was very kind early in his introductory statements, you know, because of where I've come from, I feel the bloody pain. I go into Kibera and I feel the pain. And I feel the pain of the girl who has no hope because by the time she's 12, she's going to be married or raped. I, and I actually, I genuinely feel it. Uh, and it's because I look at them as a human being, not as a statistic. And I think technology is pushing them a little away from us and we don't see it. We see them through a screen, not in flesh and blood. Very, Joshua, would you like to, can, can I just get Joshua to respond because I'm sure. No, I actually have a question for, for Bob. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah and, I, and I must appreciate or salute Bob. I think Bob is one leader I know has fought so much for Kenya, you know. And, and I think the, the question he raised, which I wanted to pull back, is the issue of uh, doing, creating things. You know, we don't always create things for smaller businesses. And engaging them a lot. The biggest challenge that they face, Bob, is uh, so corruption is an issue that you've spoken about. Um, and it probably didn't come out today. But there's a need of shortcuts. So businesses want to be able to, you can bribe. And actually, if it, for the last year, most of us in Kenya today will bribe. It's a fact. You know, we can shout and call names, but largely, when looking on the side, you'll give money. And that becomes the way then to destroy a smaller business. Now, we've been working with 10,000 young people. You know, this is a high school dropout, so high school graduates. And they have small business, a salon, they have got a carpentry, they have got a car wash. And you see energy in creating a small business. But what kills that business is someone always pays a bribe to get either their license withdrawn or their license is being harassed. Now, the question I wanted to ask you back the, to, to the young people in the room is, is the, how do they get out, out of it? How do they actually succeed? Yeah. Because it's not always the bigger companies, the Firecom or KCB, that we will not create those jobs. And Bob, this year we have 1.5 million graduates, high school and universities, of which only 200,000 may get a job. So how do you encourage the smaller business? So although we're creating a million jobs also through these small businesses, the shortcuts tend to actually either, even the owner of the business, say I can do a deal, and that deal kills the businesses, kills the employment, kills the opportunity. What could you speak to the younger people, Bob, and maybe from your own insights, um, and knowing that we actually like to pay for a bribe as a citizen of the country. You know, George, you, you know, you remember when we started this whole corruption conversation, actually a, a little while ago, when I made a statement and you were shocked and you said, you know, how dare you? Uh, and the statement that I made to Joshua, I remember where we were, we were at KSCC looking out of the window. Uh, and I said, you know, Joshua, I think, you know, Kenyans, um, I think Kenyans admire corruption. Uh, uh, and he says, no, Bob, you know, how, how dare you say that? I said, actually, Actually, you're right. I think Kenyans aspire to corruption. Um, and then we followed the conversation, and I, I think by the end of the conversation, you said, okay, I think you've got a point. Um, and I don't mean this in an offensive way, and I know some of you will be offended by it, but that's okay. Um, I, I think that we live in a, in a society, and I'm actually, to be honest with you, a bit bored with the corruption conversation because I don't see there's been any progress. And we were having lunch the other day and debating whether we do the, the declaration because the world Anti-Corruption Day is coming up, I think, in a couple of weeks. Whether we do the declaration, because we were so ridiculed. People laughed at us, they made fun of us, they did cartoons. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I asked myself, who is the fool? Is it you or is it me? Because I know when I go to bed at night, I'm going to bed with a clean conscience. You, on the other hand, you're laughing at us. You know, whether it's in the media or whatever, you're laughing at us. But you're the ones who actually are living in the corrupt world. This young man, he, he doesn't like me calling him a young man, but he's, he's still much younger than me. You're young enough to be my son. Um, <laughs> but this young man actually has the credentials to go and live and work and take his family anywhere in the world. He can pick up a job in New York tomorrow morning. He doesn't have to live in the corrupt world. The, the, the media owners, and I, you know, I'm friends with the media owners as well, um, 
And I said, you know, you take such a irresponsible view. When somebody stands up to take a transparent approach to their lives and their business, you make fun of it. How do you think you're going to get out of the, get out of the issues? So, you know, I hope with the new Chief Justice we'll see the judiciary change, which is where it should start from. I think that the, um, that the head of state is really committed to fighting this. And I think that there are a number of business leaders, actually incidentally it's a small number of business leaders, um, a number of business leaders are really genuinely committed to walk the talk, not just to talk. And this is a, you know, he's another one, and we can pick on a number of others, you know, Polycarp Igathe, for example, who's not here. But Polycarp, I know, is very committed to this thing. Um, but the rest of you, if you're stopped by the police now, and he says, you either buy me some tea, or whatever the euphemism is, or you spend the night in, in prison, and it's the weekend, of course, so you're going to be spending the weekend in prison, you're going to buy him the tea. And I can tell you that if the policeman stops me, I'm going to spend the weekend in prison, because that's what I have to do. And I can look at those two guys there, and I know they will also spend the weekend in prison. Um, but how many of you, hands up, those of you who would spend the weekend in prison? Can, can I tell you uh, my story? There's one guy back there. So, so I get, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I've got to tell you the story. I'm driving just near Museum Hill, mm -hmm. and coming down, I think it's Ojijo Road, or, or one of those roads, and I'm not moving. And the phone rings, and it's an unknown number, which normally means it's an international call, so I think I better take it. I take the call. Next thing, okay? He says, um, uh, Nishat, can I finish the story? <laughs> She's like, look at me. Are you really going to tell her? I am. So he, he says to me, let's proceed to Parkins Police Station. I said to him, you know, I'm a Kenyan. I'm 50 years old. This is the first time I'm ever going inside Parkins Police Station. He said, no, no, we're going. So we get in the Parkland's police station. I'm sitting there and thinking to my, I call Nishat up because I don't have the amounts they want nowadays, are quite big amounts. I don't carry 10,000, 20,000 or whatever, which is the amount you've got to give them legally. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I call my wife up and then the OCPD comes in and he says, ah, Mr. Colimo. And I looked at him and I thought, now what do I say? Am I Mr. Colimo? <laughs> so so, I, so I, 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 I said, I, I said, Yes. <laughs> and to be honest, I was out of Parkland's police station in two minutes. And now whenever I see him, I don't know what to do with him. <laughs> so that's the funny side to the whole thing. <laughs> I got sprung by Colin Moore without him even knowing about it. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I'd just interject that. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll try and keep it short. But um, first of all, I predicted... Uh, I predicted that Brexit was going to happen. And, uh, Did you make some money? Uh, and, but uh, that was about two years ago. And, uh, oh, wow. I Whoa. What I mean, so maybe that's why he hired me. He's, uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, but then I always tell one of my legal uh, staff in the office when they give me a problem and I'm trying to get something through. And I said, you know, you know law is something that you, that, that, that you can only claim in times of peace. Because you can't claim your legal rights in Syria, for instance. It won't help you. Mm. you know? So one of the things I said, no, one of the things about sustainable goals I was saying was that um, do you think it's something that is only applicable to those in the top 1% because the other 99% are really just trying to survive? Um, like if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the fact that you know when you can afford to have sustainable goals, is that the time when you really can have them as a goal? Because the other 99% are just trying to survive and therefore are you hopeful? because 99% of the population is really trying to survive, and therefore they can't really look to the higher ideals. Are you hopeful? Uh, yeah, I am hopeful. I, I, I am hopeful. Um, and I think for the 99%, and it's actually not the unthinkable, it's the unpalatable. Because actually, if we're really honest about ourselves, Trump becoming the president was not unthinkable. It's just we didn't like to think about it, right? It, it was just unpalatable. Um, but, but I am hopeful. And I think, you know, you've picked some really extreme examples. So if you're in Aleppo, of course, <laughs> you know, sustainable development goals is not something that's going to be top of mind. Uh, but if you're the majority of people in that kind of relatively stable kind of environment, uh, to which I refer to France, and, you know, you can see some odd results coming out of France if um, Le Pen comes through. And, and I don't know what your prediction is on this one. Um, in the United States, you know, you thought a year ago it would have been okay. But I, I think that for, for most people, 
yeah, it is, it is thinkable. And I think you know, that the citizens need to be much more demanding on the sustainable development goals than they are today. I'm still surprised if I said anybody here can put their hands up and name me six of the development goals. Um, very few people can. Martha, can you do it? You can name six. <laughs> um, but you know, the citizens, if you're, not, if you're not asking for it, then we as the leaders, and I use the whole collective we to be political leaders, business leaders, religious leaders, um, then we're not going to do it if you don't ask. Because the money actually starts from you. It doesn't start from us. You're the consumer, you're the voter, etc. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Abraham, mm -hmm. uh, an upcoming CEO, so I look up to you both. Now, um, quick questions. Uh, how do you and your company define success? And what, are the big, what is the biggest challenge you know, um, facing that success? Mm -hmm. And uh, when it's all over, how do you want to be remembered as? So the success is defined, this is a very easy one because we're very clear about this. And you, if you ask um, Steve Shege, he'll give you the same answer as me. We just define success not by the numbers, we define our success by the impact. Uh, and um, the impact is actually much more far reaching than, uh, than, than you, you would be aware of. Um, the legacy, you know, I think the legacy is, <laughs> we would really kind of like a stable, a stable society. I would, I as my legacy, I would really like to have 5,000 people or whatever the final number ends up to be, uh, who are committed to that positive impact. And, and that's it really, it's that simple. I, I thank you, Bob. Um, mine would be less of a question, more of just a comment. Uh, I like what you said about rafts, being a raft. And um, I'm even more excited when I hear you talk about your legacy. And you'll indulge me um, I hope. Uh, my focus would be more of uh, the family-owned businesses, which, if you like, uh, and this is maybe a trend you find uh, in many parts of the world, the, a lot of, a lot of uh, production, a lot of uh, organizations, a lot of the employment that is provided all over the world, and I think we are a good example. We call them SMEs, the family owned. I'd like to ask the big brands, uh, you may want to um, have a legacy that, that tries to assist some of these organizations to manage this large bit of, um, it, 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 it popularly, popularly goes under, um, the gambit of, uh, let's, let's call it succession risk management, so that, because a lot of these organizations, they, they, they move, a lot of them die with the founder, and, and some may bear me witness. Uh, I'm going to talk about funerals and death a little. Whenever a very successful businessman dies, you hear it say that he died with his luck. But it's just because certain structures were not put in place to ensure that the business transcends from one generation to the next. The foundations of some of the organizations may want to start looking at this as an opportunity to ensure that these organizations that start, that are already up and running, can then be able to move from one generation to the next. Are you in a family business? I'm in the family business. Are you first generation or second? I'm second generation. And I work very closely with a lot of family businesses. And this is some of what I do for passion, and I do it for a living as well. Um, I'll give you an example if you... But I'm not sure, uh, sorry, um, I, I don't yeah. mean to cut you off. Right. But I'm not sure that asking the banks, yes. because unless he's lent you money, right. actually it's not his business. I, I think you can see across the world, it's not yes. just in Kenya, mm -hmm. the, the stuff that skips a generation. Every other generation are the ones that pick the business up. Right. Because I start a business, my son picks it up, he didn't work hard for it. He just inherited it, it kind of goes down. And isn't it about you as the SME community and the, the, the family business community to drive that agenda rather than asking for his foundation or their foundation to be doing let, it? Let me give you, um, you know certain best practices which you as a business have been able to help you move to the next level. I think when we talk about a moral obligation to society, you have certain skills I think as, a, as, as, as um, if you like, as a CSR, as one of your uh, goals to, to, to support 
these organizations, you may want to look at it as a CSR opportunity, an opportunity to give back to society some of those skills which you know, which some of these organizations could be able to benefit, so those jobs that we are talking about can consistently be created from one generation to the next. By putting in place appropriate governance structures in some of these family-owned businesses. It doesn't... So, so, so the way we, we tackle that actually is through some of the um, organizations like the Global Compact. I'm on the board right. of the Global Compact. So if mm -hmm. you work with the local network, yep. you'll find that governance is a, is a big deal mm -hmm. and we will help you to, to, kind, of, to kind of get there. Uh, because the governance structures, actually the governance structures we have as big listed organizations, and you know, there are three of them sitting in the front row here, are actually quite different. Because the family business, you know, you make all your calls, whereas for me, I would bet you probably 50% of the people in here are my shareholders, and I'm actually accountable to them, whereas as a family business, you tend to be accountable to yourself. But those governance structures, you will pick up quite a lot of that working out of the, um, the local, I would urge you to join the local network. Excellent. Just a comment. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Good morning. morning. My name is Martha, and I run a startup company that's in the telecommunication value added services space. Why I can mention six SDGs is because we, as a company, we started there. What are we going to address? And we chose SDG 8, which is decent job and economic growth. Now, under that, you have labor productivity. Now in terms of productivity, it, sh it shows how low our productivity is as Kenyans. To add on to that, for us, we are primarily a software development company. So we need data for our productivity. We bill per hour. So when I look at how much time um, that our people waste, waiting for their pages to load and refresh, we're based in Kikuyu town. We have no fiber. So mm -hmm. I made a few calls, the, the normal route, um, and you know, were told that, yeah, maybe you're in next year's plan and all those things. And so I made other calls, right? And I don't think we're in the plan. Now, we have to put up. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true, but I, I don't think we're in that plan. And now we have to put up with WiMAX, which, by the way, is very unreliable. I just calculated how much time um, my, each person on my team has to wait about 30 minutes per day. If you convert that to the month, you can do the math and see how much money we lose. All right. Now, as Bob, you are really focused on transforming lives. As Bob, below you, it's about transforming numbers. When I made a call and I asked about us getting Wi-Fi, I was told, unfortunately, I mean, us getting fiber. They said, unfortunately, um, your company is too small to be able to push this complaint forward. And then we had a team from KCB come and visit our office, because we're also tenderpreneurs, yeah? <laughs> and they come and they ask, do you have fiber? So of course our answer was no, we have no fiber. And so these are the things that we're saying, we don't have to wait to be a huge company to address these SDGs, but we want to address them. And we have companies like Fun Kids also in Kikuyu, they face the same challenge when it comes to data. So how can you help us? And how can you help startups that are operating in smaller towns? Because obviously we can't afford to be in Nairobi. Sure. Um, look, I mean, the, the, fiber, the fiber story is, is, um, is not about the will, because, of course, if you give you fiber, we'll make more money out of it. So, you know, that, that's a no-brainer. Uh, and you've got Moses right next to you there. Um, the, the big problem around... She used to be an ex safaricom <laughs> colleague. Uh, the, the big problem with fiber, really, is way leaves. If I can get way leaves, I'll put fiber all over the country. But every county in this country want to screw us over on way leaves. And uh, how many people do you need to get permission before you can put fiber in? You know, it's a whole chain, uh, which that, that's the complexity of it. It's not about the size of the business, because of course if I can give you fiber, you'll use a lot more and we'll make more money out of you. But it, it's, it's about some of the bureaucracy in, in getting stuff done. You know, when did we sign the KPLC deal? It's like eight months ago. Nothing has happened so far. Good afternoon. My name is Joseph Otwoko. I'd like to ask you, Bob, call more a question because 
I respect you as a business leader, and we look up to you. But there's something that most of our business leaders in Kenya, they just say success leaves a clue. But most of us cannot identify those clues because a good percentage of you guys don't write books. That is something that uh, we have really as youth, that's why you, you see that youths are looking for shortcuts because they're like, okay, I cannot figure out what Bob Colmo did when he was like me during the tough situations and he was able to succeed. The reason why you see that Think and Grow Rich book is still considered in the market up to date and still relevant is because people like Henry Ford during those time in Napoleon Hill, they took time and they knew that for us to be able to give a hope to America during the tough time, during the time of the depression, one thing we must be considered that we must pass knowledge. <coughs> so what are you, as a Bob Colmo and your friends like Joshua doing to be able to, to come up with books? And when you write books, some of you write books, they say it's so expensive for, for the youth. And so, that's something I've been really wondering as a person. Why should I buy a book for Donald Trump, which is costing me around 1,000 shillings in Kenya? But you find a Kenyan was written a book and it's charging around 6,000. And when you're like looking at the, at the impact, you realize that, okay, the one for Donald Trump is, has more impact. And I think that's something that we, as business, uh, as business people who are coming up, we are really looking forward because we want to succeed the Kenyan way. And for us to succeed the Kenyan way, we must get the information from the Kenyan sources. Thank you. Um, Are you going to write a book? Let me... <laughs> I told you I didn't go to university. I, I, how do I know to write? Um, I, I, from a very personal level, I, I spend more time reading um, because I still think that I've got a great deal more to learn than to impart. Um, so you're, you're not likely to get a book from me. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's very clear. Um, and as I get older, because I'm actually quite old, uh, as I get older, the more I learn about how little I know. And so my wife will tell you, I spend a lot more time reading now than I did when I was younger. Um, the second thing is the, Kenya, the so-called Kenyan way. Look, there's no such thing as a Kenyan way. I know I'm going to upset you people by saying this. There's no such thing as a Kenyan way. Um, you know, there's just only one way of doing it. Uh, Lamin here is from Ghana. You've worked, Gambia, it sounds with a G. Um, you've worked in a number of different countries. There's no Gambian way of doing business or Kenyan way. Uh, my shareholders come from all over the world, and I have to operate in, um, in one way, which is a universal way. There's a universal way of making a business work. It's, you know, you buy it at one price, you sell it at a high price. Uh, we've got Barrett who's hiding here. Um, again, one of the self-made successful businessmen in this country. Uh, and I don't think that you can go back to your other shareholders in WPP and say, this is the Kenyan way of doing it. If you're running an advertising company, Martin Sorrell will just expect you to work in the same way as if you're working in Spain. Uh, but there's a lot of knowledge out there to be, to be gained. You, you don't need to look at the old boys or the young ones or the middle ones. Like, um, you're 48 now, right? Well, that's terrible. <laughs> 52. The old boys. <laughs> jo jo Joshua's the youngest. Joshua's the youngest. Uh, good morning. My name is Joseph Mwangi. And my question is on manufacturing. Um, my question is, what would you say to somebody thinking today, what can we manufacture in Kenya? And where do we start? Because I'm a bit shocked that uh, in Africa we don't want to make anything. Uh, during the last session of MindSpeak, Ali Khan actually said that 50% uh, of our economy is now in service. So it is, yeah which means that agribusiness and manufacturing has to squeeze into the remaining bit. So I'm a bit concerned that how do we get people to get into the manufacturing space? Well, look, I mean, I think you need, need to look at the market. And as I was having dinner last night at the Strathmore thing, I was sitting next to the former finance minister of Uganda, and I, I pointed to her because she'd arguing that She'd been arguing that, that uh, you know, agribusiness is where we need to be investing, which of course is true, but not exclusively so. We need to do other stuff because the problem with agribusiness is also very reliant on externalities, weather, drought, stuff like that. And uh, incidentally, as the world gets warmer, it becomes more difficult. But then I looked at the, the napkin, the table napkin, and it said made in Turkey. 
well, you know, why are we making a bloody table ma napkin in Turkey? It's a piece of white cloth with some stitching. I can make it. And why aren't we doing that? The market is here. So there's a lot of stuff. In, you don't have to make wristwatches. Everybody wants to make TVs and computers. You, it's not going to happen. It's simply, you will not be making TVs and computers here because you don't have a, there's no supply chain. Whoever's going to make it, you're going to need to bring everything from the Far East to Britain. But there, there are ready markets for stuff. Uh, you know, these beads, I love the beads that every Kenyan wears. Even, I've got too many stuff in my hands now, but I, I was going to bring one just as an example. You know these, mm. these colored things that says yeah. Kenya? Uh, it's, it's quintessentially Kenyan, isn't it? Where do the beads come from? China or India? You, even the beads are coming from China. So, guys, you, you know, finding a market, trust me, when I get fired by my board, I will make things in Kenya because my wife wouldn't let me go live anywhere else anymore. Um, oh man, she's giving me a look from the front seat. <laughs> <laughs> but I, there are markets for things. The guy in front of you, Isaac, you know, he's got a hat. You could make that hat here. I bet you that hat is probably made somewhere else. The, there are markets. Well, yes, Barath. And, uh, oh, actually, can we just take... Uh, no, don't do the point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just to make a comment, um, I think Bob referred white hair means I've been here longer than a lot of you around. And a lot of you may remember um, Kikome, Rivetex, Raymond Woolen Mills, right? Now, FYI, these were companies um, in the garment trade. Uh, Raymond Woolen Mills used to make suits, woolen fabric, uh, blankets. Uh, Kikome used to make uh, cotton, Kisumu cotton mills, Rivetex. These were famous brand names um, the time that I had set up the advertising business and they were cl big clients of ours. It was a thriving textile industry in this country. What went wrong? Does anybody know? No, Mituma came much later. Government supporting. Tanzania had a very large textile industry. Uh, it fell apart. What happened in China and what happens in India today is the governments protect the local industries, right? It's, I think it's probably maybe recently that China has opened its borders to imported fabric or textiles. India, even today, you cannot import textile without hundreds of different licenses. They protect the local industry. So what happened was the government protected the local industry, things started, the local industries developed the skill, eventually got the scalability, the technology, and they started producing and exporting. What happened here was, container loads of textile were being allowed, despite the fact that the government had all kinds of duty structures in place. And the, the same fabric from China would compete with the fabric from Kikome. And that fabric was 20, 30, 40% cheaper because people didn't pay duties, the containers were offloaded, corruption. So I think for us, the bigger problem to get what Bob is saying is we need to deal with this big animal called corruption. If I can get cheaper textile imported by container loads, by not paying my duty, it will come in, it will flood in. Even garment manufacturing, if you're going to River Road and, and that race course road, I don't know if you, a lot of you remember that, a lot of garments were manufactured. Remember Colpro? This famous company made safari clothing, Copro. Everybody was there. They used to make and make garments. What happened? All this nonsense of corruption. So I think for us, that in my view is also one of the big, big um, disruptions uh, that we have. <laughs> look, look, I can't, I can't. No. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Wangwe Collimore, and I have a question for you, Mr. Collimore. Um, I hear you saying that, yes, we need to be building industries, we need to be making stuff. I hear you, and I get you. But I also hear you saying that you don't want to have this com conversation about corruption. Now, as a young business owner, myself, a startup myself, I can't get past thinking about that if, even if I wanted to expand, I have to think about the licenses or the number of people that I may have to bribe along the way. It goes back to what Barat is saying about corruption. When you're talking about us making beads and making all these small things, 
we may have a mind to do something larger. But when you think about the long game and you think about all the hurdles that you have to jump through past developing your business, it becomes a hard thing for us to even get to that point. I urge you not to stop having this conversation about corruption. So to take you back to a question that you'd asked um, before you were interrupted, where you said, how many people are willing to spend the night or weekend in jail? I think there are people who are willing to do so. But I think there's also a bunch of people who don't realize what that costs them in terms of their life or their businesses or the time that they spend in jail. So you might be willing to spend time in jail, but you'll never spend time in jail. Ali Khan got off on your name and your identity. So when you please, please ask, don't mention that anymore. <laughs> when you ask us to take the leap, we kind of want to ask you to show us how. Now that may mean that maybe we need godfathers, in a sense, to help us figure out the channels, but it may also mean that maybe we could ask you to continue having a conversation with KEPSA or with the powers that be and tell them that it's killing us and to show by example. Mine is just a comment, but I want to put that out to you. <laughs> Joshua, let me, uh, let me ask you if my brother to answer, answer my wife. Please. Are you taking that, Joshua? <laughs> I think Wambwe, I probably know about the business she set up and I know the challenge, but it is true that bigger businesses do get away. We do get away definitely than smaller businesses will do. So, so I think the challenge for us is to speak more and, and also even at KEPSA forums where Bob and I haven't played a big role, so you're right, that we've stayed away from conversations. We've actually rethought that we're going back. Remember that we never got any support from the industry sector, but we are going back to challenge. You may not get a smaller business views from KEPSA, but I think we can be the voice that pushes for doing right. Uh, and KEPSA can actually be speaking stronger for businesses like you, who may not raise, you know, even if you raise your contributions membership, they will not even focus on the issue that you raise in there. So we can raise those issues directly that you have. But you raised an important point, that sometimes we, we need to speak more. It's a, it's a difficult challenge, and Bob, it's up to you. I mean, we have more friends that you, that you can see, maybe few. In reality, that. Um, it, the biggest challenge of corruption is the private sector itself. And large companies, smaller companies, call them, are the ones... So we don't speak because we do behind, behind the scenes. But you've taken a challenge, and I can assure you that we will take up the challenge head on into, into the CAPSA conversations. Thank you. Um. Uh, my name is Joel, and uh, I would like us to be um, problem solutions oriented. We've talked a lot about uh, the government is doing this, we don't have this. If I have to do this uh, as a small, as an SME, we have to do a certain thing. So my question is to Bob. Uh, a while ago, um, Safaricom uh, started an initiative called Zindua Cave. And uh, on the website I see they write, they've written that uh, you get 700 submissions uh, a year. Uh, my first question is, uh, how many of those 700 submissions have seen the light of the day and has proceeded from there and uh, created a few of the jobs? Yeah, I mean, let me be honest with you. I don't think we've done very well in that space. I've, I've said it before, uh, which is why we're taking a different approach on innovation. And we're setting up a separate innovation hub outside of the organization, because it gets lost, it gets grounded, you know. I've got these 5,000 people who are just on a treadmill delivering all those numbers that Ali Khan talked about, and they don't want to get distracted with other stuff, doesn't matter how much I say. And so the only way to deal with it is to set up a separate unit, which is away from the building, somewhere else, different set of people who are going to manage that, and I think we'll hopefully see some better results. Because if I ask myself, how much do we invest in that, you know, what it used to be called R&D in the old days, but innovation now, it's certainly not enough. We've invested some money in some small businesses, so uh, things like Sendi, um, and there's a, a Link, uh, and some others. Uh, and, you know, those, those companies are doing well. We have been linking with some others that we're investing in. Uh, but through the Zendua route, I mean, hardly any, to be honest. 
Good morning, everyone. Morning. My name is Nancy Marangu, and my question is, what is the position of Safaricom on electronic mm -hmm. waste management? And secondly, what is the role of the telecommunication industry in championing for the climate change effects and its mitigations? Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Um, on uh, electronic waste, mm -hmm. I think we have salvaged the equivalent <laughs> 78, the equivalent weight of 78 elephants worth of electronic waste. Uh, not just our own waste, but electronic waste in general. So if we've got an old TV, we have, um, we've taken it in across the country and uh, recycled most of it. There's, the facilities don't exist in the country to, to recycle everything, so some of it has to then be shipped overseas. Um, more generally, uh, climate change, uh, you know, as you would gathered if you were here uh, earlier, that it's a big deal for me personally. Um, and so I think that we need to do all we can. We've started to report on our, our own carbon footprint, which sadly grew last year by 10%, but we're now targeting ourselves again to reduce that, despite the growth in the overall business. So by measuring carbon footprint and reducing carbon footprint, uh, we think we will start to get a grip in it. We're investing a lot more in mm -hmm. use of renewable energy in our base stations, renewable energy in our other installations, the use of LED lighting in all of our buildings, um, uh, and even in my own office, you know, if I'm working late at night, which I try not to, uh, it suddenly goes dark because it, there's movement sense. I can't even turn the lights on and off. There's a movement sensor, so mm -hmm. if there's nobody there, then it, um, it's, it's not on. Uh, so we're, we're doing some stuff. We're also working with um, companies like MCOPA, who are currently connecting about 550 new households per day using renewable energy. Uh, and at a more personal level, I sit on the board of Acumen, and we are investing something like $40 million in East Africa, both in Kenya and uh, Rwanda in the early stages, in renewable household energy. We started some discussions with people like PowerHive, so you bring renewable micro microgrids to communities, to remote communities. So, you know, quite a lot of stuff. There's a lot more we can do, of course. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it was a really powerful presentation. Uh, I just wanted to hear more about what were the motivations of Safaricom to sort of really focus on climate change and um, sustainability issues. Because I find that for most corporate organizations, it's a CSR activity. It's one of those things you do just because you want to give back. Whereas you highlighted in your presentation, those are key issues uh, in, in, for the future. So how do you think this can be made more, you know, part of core business for private sector. We're banning the use of the word CSR in the company. We, we hate it. Well, we, we hate it because I hate it. And I think CSR ends up being something that sits in a little department. And when times get rough, that's the first thing you, you, you cut. So uh, we believe you have to really embed it in your company. And sustainability is embedded throughout the organization. It's not just Sando Jambo who heads up that unit. What she heads up, is the thought leadership and the reporting, but it's embedded even in the finance department. The finance director is sitting um, in the, the row behind you. Um, so in every department, we have embedded the SDGs. And so Satish will tell you which of the SDGs he is focused upon. Why climate change? Because you should all be concerned about climate change. There's nobody in this room that would be excluded. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about climate change is if America pollutes, you suffer. Uh, and so we just think that this is the mm -hmm. biggest challenge facing humanity. If the world last year was 1.4 degrees warmer than it was in 1820, and we have given ourselves right up until 2050 to limit it, and it doesn't go down, right? So to limit it, then we're really not in a good place. And so we just think, you know, forget what other people do. I don't really care what, uh, what um, Scanner does. That's his problem. Let me just do what I can do, and let me do what I can influence. But I think companies really need to embed sustainability in their core operation, not just in a department. 18 out of the 20 uh, hardest hit climate change countries are going to be in Africa, are, are in Africa. So you can understand why it should be central to something like Bob's thinking. Thank you. Yeah. First of all, I congratulate our CEO of Safaricom. I do have a business in Meru. I do have another from Meru. Because of the study, the uh, MPSA Kadogo is doing a lot of good things. 
my people are in Ghana, are small businessmen. I'm doing business since 2011 in the safari company. First, my people ask me. So I've never heard of uh, this winning of the, like, uh, my league. People ask me. I've never had one, one. They pray for these things. More than from Mary this morning, and that's right, that's been down there. Why me? So these people ask me, how come you see people in the millions? <laughs> <laughs> and I've never had. They come to my shop. Because I work on, I know, I run this business. Because I work on for many years. They ask me, how come I had people even in millions? And I've never had even a friend telling me that you have one of them. That's all for me. Well, I must say, uh, even me. Uh, <laughs> Even, even me, I've never had a friend who's won. Um, <laughs> so you, you, guys, you guys have not won anything, not told me. Eh? Um, even I've never had a friend who's won. But I think we do publicize uh, quite widely. And now what we're doing, because we've been accused of all sorts of things in the past, so now we do them at the regional level. So each region, we've effectively got their own, their own contest, because people are saying, well, you know, it's only from one community that people are winning it. Uh, so now we move it because you know what you Kenyans are like. So now we actually spread it across the country. But uh, the details, uh, I think, are all available on things like the website and stuff like that. Thank you very much, um, Bonabo Colimo, and uh, the very distinguished panel up there. My You're not on my panel. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're business leaders all together. <laughs> So um, mine is a very simple one. There's been a lot of questions that have been asked, and a lot of them, and uh, like also what was mentioned in terms of the issues of youth, corruption, and other issues. What I wanted to ask, and I believe this is uh, one that uh, answers quite a lot of other questions. I believe the kind of cloud that uh, some of you business leaders are holding in terms of as taxpayers to this government and uh, many other things. And the number of people that you employ, including ourselves as youth. I believe you have enough clout to leverage the government to make some changes in terms of um, some of these issues that we are having. My question to you is, are you looking at, when we hear Safaricom making profits of, I don't know, 30, 40 billion Kenya shillings, that I believe is enough for you and um, the other business leaders to go and tell the government, uh, here we need to do things this way because these are the people that are under us this is the amount of money that we're paying to the taxpayers, and this money needs to be used in a way that is going to address most of these other particular issues that you've mentioned. So, Mr. Bob Collimo, this is to you directly, including the other leaders that we have here. How are you looking at using that leverage to push also our government to look at these issues that we are facing. Thank you. So I don't think um, that it's our place to tell any government uh, anything. Um, we can have conversations. We have conversations and we do some stuff. So I mean, last year, you know, we, a bunch of us got together and we drafted the anti-corruption bill, which is somewhere, I have no idea where it is right now. Um, uh, we engaged, I know, I don't want to get into the banking sector's issues, but you know, the interest rate capping bill, for example, was something which I think businesses made its disposition clear. I know the banks were the ones who were in the firing line, but it, in fact it's affected everybody. We're now beginning to see the consequences of that. Um, but, you know, politics is something which businesses should never get involved in. And there are times in any cycle of a government where it is more politics than logic. Mm -hmm. And that's when we would always back out of that space and say, you politicians, you do your stuff. But we, we do engage in a number, of, uh, a number of things. And for companies like mine, it's very difficult because you know, we often get accused of being dominant and bullies and things like that. 
And we try as hard as we can, but as you rightly say, we have a responsible position in society to speak out on some issues. So we will speak out on issues like human rights. We will speak out on the rights of, uh, of the girl child um, and children in general. We will speak out on climate change issues. So those are things which, irrespective of politics, we will take a, a position and stand firmly and defend it. And corruption, although I have to say that I'm feeling a little battle-worn. I mean, to be perfectly candid with you, you can see uh, Mrs. Collingmore at the front here uh, recognizes that. Bob, quick question from social media. Ravi's asking, what's the latest on M-Pesa becoming a messenger app rather than just a payment platform? It like becomes I'm like gonna, WeChat. Like I'm going to tell in my secrets. <laughs> Hi, Ali Khan. Hi, Nick. Uh, hi, Bo. Uh, my name is Deborah. I've missed mine speak so much, by the way. <laughs> no, we're glad to, to be um, back. Mine is largely a perspective. I was so excited to hear you talk about evolution because there's this theory I have in my head I keep telling my friends um, or whoever would listen. Um, agrarian revolution, agriculture was the in thing. Land was the big thing. Industrial revolution, industries was the big thing. And now we're in the digital and information age, and this is the big thing. So for me, I see it as a way where the universe accords us mm -hmm. a new chance to get new millionaires and new billionaires. It's, it's just a way. But it doesn't mean that what doesn't work, what didn't work before, and that's uh, manufacturing, and that's agriculture, it doesn't work. So what happens is that the people in this revolution usually take digital as the only way to go, and you know, that talk of Silicon Valley. So you get really narrow-minded on digital, and then later you become us who, you know, when you sit with your friends and you're like, when people's parents were getting land for 5,000 on thicker road, where were my parents? You know, you become those people who have, you know, make such kinds of comments. So I'd like to encourage people to be more open-minded. I'm glad to hear you're also a member of Acumen. Um, I don't have an university education also, but <laughs> I've been in business. Uh, this is my third year. Um, it's been very challenging, and um, I have taken the initiative to teach myself. So Acumen has a lot of free courses. If you need to learn um, anything, they're usually three-month courses. If you need to learn anything, I'm very curious about learning about supply chain and all these things. So I usually go and enroll for a course. I do financial management. I had a big problem. In, I used to tell people, I can't, touch, I can't touch finances. I'm good in math, but I need an accountant to do that. Until with time you realize your accountant also has a way they do things. So <laughs> I had to go and know how to read numbers and translate numbers for my business. So I'd like to encourage guys, you know, Acumen has that, I oh, think, second. yeah. Thank okay. you very much for that. Yeah, so I think the investment is good, probably get the word out a bit more. Um, about the products, for everybody, I, I like how you, you brought that thing up, because largely other than government, you know, things like, if you look at supply chain and you look like, um, I'm doing manufacturing and I want to get into product making because service is really easy because I just have to show up and provide but products it's really you know how where location electricity licenses um, this is where I like mind speak now I'll, I'll, I'll come back to those Kenjan did a mind speak some few months back and anybody who attended would know that they're building Okari industrial park which is meant to be Kenya's they are on where you can go and put up an industry and make things there at the same price you make things in China for. So you know when you take your time to expose yourself and come to MindSpeak, you get to know such opportunities. And you know you won't say that I have to go to China to make. You just have to go to Kenjan and know what do I have to do? Do I have to seek partners? And probably from Kenjan's point of view and maybe business leaders' point of view, you can come up with packages or just, um, for, for people who are starting up or people who need some sort of support, so long as <clears throat> the business plan looks solid and legit. Can I, can I just intersect because it's going on a bit now, but okay. I really... Last I one? I, yes. Mentorship saved my life, so I would encourage everybody. I've, I'm only in three years in business because of my mentor. I want to quit so many times, 
But if you can mentor somebody, do it. If you have to find a mentor, if you can't follow, come to mind, speak, follow, follow people, talk to people. You don't have to have somebody physical. Read a book, open your mind, open your way of thinking. Don't go into it narrowly. I agree with That's you, it. and I think the thing that has opened and given us the ticket to, to look at the entire world is actually the phone. I will just follow up quickly and make one quick point. He's, he's nice to make a point. Can I just say, um, that, that, that lady, what, sorry, what was her name? Deborah. Deborah. Now, Deborah demonstrates to you the advantage of not going to university. Right? <laughs> she's struggled for everything she's done. Uh, you know, she said to, to you that you can find the information you need. You, didn't know, you don't need to go and do an MBA no. because you can do the acumen, the plus acumen courses. They're actually very comprehensive. Even I, you know, follow some of them. She's talked to you about you know, going to okay. So she's, she's, a hustler. she's what I would define as a proper hustler. She didn't get the silver spoon. She didn't go to the University of Nairobi or wherever else. But she has gone out and she has actually done it herself. So well done, Deborah. Thank you. I think we can take one more question before I wrap up. I think there was a lady there. Yes, you, you've been, had your hand up for a long time. So can we take that question from there? Okay, you, okay two questions. We're taking yours and then we're going over there. Yeah, thank you, Bob, and thank you, Ali, for this forum. I think it's one forum that is good for everyone to get free education and meet the people who influence the government. Now, my question goes on the academy. You told us that the universities are teaching us stuff that we just remember and doesn't help anyone. I appreciate the change that Safaricom has made in finance. I, um, my question is on how is the academy going to change the space of education? How are you making sure they're not just going to remember things that don't help anyone tomorrow? So that's a leading question. My second question, <laughs> my second question is on, uh, you remember you said uh, we'll have more plastic than fish sometime. How are you instilling the discipline about the environment? the care of the environment to the little ones. Because I think as we drive around, we all have been to the La Mer. Just immediately after the La Mer, there's a lot of plastic there. Why don't we have the discipline of we heat and drink and dispose, then drive and dis drink and dispose on the roadside? How is that discipline being still in the young ones so that we don't have, I don't believe in changing the people who are 50 plus, I want to change them before they're teenagers, and I think whatever is acquired before teenagehood lives all the way to adulthood. Thank you. Okay, so uh, there was a good prompt there for me to give a plug on the, the Ampesa Academy. The Ampesa Academy is actually our proudest achievement. You know, we are building an academy in Thika, which is currently catering for 97. We have now taken over 300 kids in. It will cater for, uh, when the whole thing is complete, uh, 1,000 children. 1,000 children from the most deprived backgrounds and we test how deprived those backgrounds are, but they're also very bright children. So these kids are coming out with scores of 400 or so, and um, some of them are coming from places where they don't have toilets. And we've had the first year, and if you go meet these children now, you would be surprised at uh, these future leaders. They have, we've decided to give them a very rounded education. So not only are they having the best of academia, um, all of these children have an iPad. I mean, that's where we start from. So every child has an iPad. Every teacher has an iPad and a smartphone. It has the fastest, uh, the fastest internet connection, which Martha will kill for. Um, it has uh, the, the, the best of input from people like Sue Humbo from uh, Green Dreams. Uh, we have um, Elizabeth and Drogi on music. We have, I um, can't remember who we have on sports. I think it... Um, I can't remember who it is, but you know, the best sports facilities of any school in the country. Uh, it has the best arts facility. It has 50 acres of farmland. They already have hundreds of thousands of chickens, I think, which they're, which they're farming. Um, it has the best of sustainable energy use. Um, it's just going to be the best school in Africa. It's that simple. Uh, and we have input from uh, people who are running Storehe, the Africa Leadership Academy. Etc. So it is going to be the best school in uh, in Africa, uh, catering for the most deprived children and uh, developing future leaders, not future managers. So that's that's how we're going to deal with that issue. In terms of the um, the, the plastic stuff, you know, we start with our own our own thing. 
So we don't, all the plastics we use now are biodegradable. Uh, can you change the mindset for somebody who throws a plastic bottle out of the window? I don't think that I can do it. Um, but I think that in the collective, we can do it. If you stop the person from throwing the, the plastic bottle out of the matatu, you know, just accost them, just say, why did you do that? Um, but you know, I, I think it's a whole, it's, it's, a, it's a tough area, but it does start with you. Uh, and when last did you throw a plastic wrapping away? Or did you put it in your pocket and take it home? I usually do actually take these things and take them home. We need to get rid of plastics. I mean, it's that simple. Quick question before we go to that last question, which I promised over there. Somebody's asking about, you know, a lot of these, uh, given your experience in creating value for shareholders and the government and the taxes you've paid, asking about privatization of failing state-owned enterprises. What is your view on that? I don't know. You don't know? Okay. <laughs> Should, should one sort of, you know, start flogging them off if they're not successful, you know? Governments are not good at running businesses. Uh, um, government interference in any business is, um, is risky. Uh, we see, uh, I mean, I'm lucky. I have a large shareholder who is government, 35% shareholder, but they don't interfere in my business. Mm. Um, in fact, I have to go, you know, fight with them uh, for as anybody else. Um, and I'm really glad they don't interfere in my business. I'm also really glad that the other big shareholder doesn't interfere in my business. We as a management team just get on with it. Um, but I, I think that government is not designed to be, to, running, to, to be running business. They're designed to make policy. And if they focus on making policies, governments, generally, I don't mean the Kenyan government, don't want to get into trouble. Work permit is coming for renewal soon. Um, <laughs> um, then I think if they just focus on policy development, strong policy development with a good worldview, mm. then we're good. And then leave us businessmen and businesswomen to fail or succeed. I mean, we're not all going to succeed, of course. Madam, you're closing the session with your final question. Uh, hi. Um, my name is Wangeshi. I love Mindspeak. The conversations are very stimulating. Good. I'm glad. So, yeah. <laughs> um, you want me to stand? I'm really short, yes. so I don't know if it will make a difference. Yeah. Can you see me? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I wear work. I work a lot with um, situations where you have to solve a problem. And mostly you have to look ask the problem and understand the problem before you can solve it. And you're right, we have a problem. Um, people are not creating, people are not manufacturing. I think the problem runs deeper than we think. I think this is a societal issue. Here you have a kid who is raised not to think outside the box. You have a kid who is raised to think that you have to go to a national school, mm -hmm. then university, get a good job, all right? It should be, can you do this? The answer should be, why not? So I think what you should do, these kids who are being raised, these kids who are going to be enrolled at your academy, to be taught to have open minds, to be taught to think, but why can I not do this? I, I mean, I need this. I need underwear. Did you know we import underwear? So it's about... It's so sad. Mm. I, I, yeah, look, I think you're right. I, I mean, I, I, you know, one of my criticisms of, um, of some of the university education here, actually not just the university, education generally is, as I said earlier, is that we don't develop creative thinkers. I, I would much rather, actually, I would much rather hire somebody who, you know, developed as a musician because I know he or she will, will come with a more creative solution. I don't care about whether you've got an upper second or a first class. That doesn't prove to me that you're creative. The world needs creative thinkers. And um, you know, the lady in the front here is also a creative thinker. Um, she went to, where did you go? She went to <laughs> study, <laughs> you know, she, studied, <laughs> she studied in, in Kenya, in the United States, and in the United Kingdom, right? Um, and she's a historian, so she did her master's at Oxford. But actually, if you say, well, what are you? She'll say, I'm an artist, because she's a creative thinker. And creative thinkers are the people who are going to change the world, not the ones 
who remember how to do things, to my earlier point. And absolutely, at the Ambassador Academy, man, when you see what those kids are doing, I, the things I really am most excited about. If you see how those children, after one year, how those creative thinkers are thinking, kids who didn't have shoes when we first met them. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Mr. Collymore for a really different... A different mind speaker sweep through history and a discussion about all kinds of things from Donald Trump to climate change to everything. Thank Can you very one, much. One last point on Donald yes. Trump. Yes. Um, there is, and this is just for transparency and declaration, and so you know that there, there was a bit of a conflict of interest in both Lamin and me in supporting, in believing that Donald Trump would become <laughs> Trump. Joshua can hardly contain himself. In, in kind of anticipating Donald Trump becoming yes. the president. So, on the 22nd of June, 2016, my salary was worth, you know, X dollars. Yes. On the 23rd of June, and Lamin is also paid in sterling, right, because he works for the British Bank. So on the 23rd of June, our salary declined by 15% immediately and has stayed at that point. And so on the 24th of June, I called Lamin and I said, the only thing we can hope for now is, Trump. is a Trump victory. <laughs> <laughs> So our salary has recovered a bit, but it's not what is so. You, you'll be surprised when we announce that. Josh and I have agreed that we will declare again, actually, in a week or so. Um, but my salary has declined, actually, as, as Lamin's over the year. So that's why we were hoping that Trump would win. <laughs>